Hi everyone, so in this presentation we're going to continue from where we left off in the previous presentation talking about classes, objects, inheritance and encapsulation and this week we're going to explore the topic of constructors in more depth. We're going to talk about default constructors which don't take parameters and we're going to talk about non-default constructors which do take parameters. We're going to talk about the keyword this which is a helpful way of referring to a current object that is being used in the code without actually having to name the object itself. So we can actually write this keyword, this, into our classes, and then that will be substituted with whatever object that is referring to this code at any given time. So we'll have a look at that and where we can use that. Uh, we'll also talk about passing objects by reference into our classes and uh, different uh, member functions that want to use and refer to objects. We'll talk about copy constructors, creating shallow copies of objects as well as deep copies of objects. Uh, we'll also talk about converting constructors or sometimes you may see them referred to as conversion constructors. And then finally, we'll talk about static members where we can can create static data members and static member functions. And let's start by casting our mind back to the difference between creating a static object and creating a dynamic object. And if you remember, we create a dynamic object by setting up a pointer of class type, which then points to an object created on the heap. And we do that by using the keyword new after the assignment operator. And then what we do is we call a function because we see the parentheses and that function has the same name as the class. And if you remember, we called that the constructor. And in a dynamic object creation, that's it called explicitly because it's stated there, as you remember, it's an explicit call to the function of the same name of the class. Whereas in a static object, we don't see that second half of the statement. We don't create an object on the heap. On, in a static object, we create it on the stack. So therefore, we don't use the keyword new. And instead, we actually just state the class type. Uh, which in this case, uh, we see an example of my class as the name of the class. And then immediately following that, we have the identifier name, uh, the object name. Okay, so this is exactly the same as creating a variable of primitive type. Here, we're just creating a variable of a class. And that's going to be created on the stack in the same way that uh, primitive type variables would be created on the stack. And uh, as we see here, we don't actually have a explicit call to the constructor. Therefore, when we create a static object, we implicitly call the constructor. We don't have an explicit call to it. And uh, we might get confused because if we try and have an explicit call to the constructor, for example, in the second blue box here, where you see my class, name of the class, and then my object immediately followed by a pair of parentheses, which are empty, and then semicolon, that actually doesn't call the constructor of the class, actually creates a function of the class. Class. It actually attempts to define and create a uh, constructor, uh, which is uh, which is not what we want to do. It's actually the wrong place for uh, creating and defining the constructor. We want to do this within the context of our class, so that it's all cohesive, so that all the functions that uh, the class describes are contained within the class itself. So what we can do is we can actually start defining our own constructors. And uh, you may or may not have done this last week. So if you haven't, we can have a go at uh, doing that this week. OK, and uh, as we mentioned, they're typically used for initializing the data members of the class itself. So all of the attributes, all of the characteristics of the classes, such as ID values or names of uh, entities, uh, other types of attributes, we can actually define default values that we want to assign to them. And then we can also set up non-default constructors where we pass in that information to customize the state of the object. So we can actually define set values representing a particular object. 
And so regardless of whether we're defining a default constructor, which uh, doesn't take parameters, it actually just assigns default values, or whether we are actually passing values in for the data members of a particular object, which is the non-default constructor, regardless, we need to follow the same rules for declaring both types of constructors. And as we've already seen with the explicit call to the constructor in the dynamic object creation, we have have to create a function with the same name as the class. All right, so if we're using a mixture of uppercase and lowercase letters, it has to match exactly in terms of casing. And uh, the constructor is also unique in that it doesn't have any return type or any return statements within the constructor itself. And then finally, it's usually located in the public interface. And of course, this is so that it can be called and invoked from outside of the class that it's defined in. Because of course, we tend to create our objects of classes within the main function. So as that's located in a different file, uh, we have to be able to publicly access the constructor from the main function. So let's have a look at an example of creating a default constructor. So if you cast your eye to the blue box at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that uh, the class is called my class. Note the uppercase M and uppercase C in that uh, name there for the class. And then within the class, there's a private interface which has a data member, an integer variable for value, and then in the public interface, we have a function. Uh, notice the parentheses there. So notice it's got the same name as the class with uppercase M and uppercase C. So therefore, a function, the same name of the class is the constructor. And you'll also notice an empty parameter list. So there's uh, nothing in the parentheses. So therefore, this is the default constructor, a constructor which takes no parameters. And then within the constructor, we assign the value of zero to the data member called value. So this is an example where we might just initialize the data member for value, which uh, later, maybe through a setter function, is then set to a more meaningful value for that uh, value data member. Okay, so this is an example of a user-defined default constructor because we're the ones defining it, therefore it's uh, called user-defined. But of course, as we said, uh, if we don't define one manually, then the compiler is likely to create one, even though it doesn't have the instruction to assign zero to the data members or initialize any other types of data members. Um, so seemingly it doesn't do anything, but behind the scenes it is actually uh, assigning memory for the objects and the contents of the objects. And uh, in this slide here, we've got an example of the default constructor being assigned in the private interface. And uh, as you remember, we said this is not a good idea because of course, if we want to create an object, then we need to have access to the constructor because it's going to be invoked regardless of whether it's an explicit call to the constructor when we create a dynamic object or whether it's a implicit call via the static object creation. Uh, we're going to call it regardless so therefore we need public access to it and because it's defined in the private interface that's no good and uh, the code actually won't compile it'll actually give us a syntax error and advise us to uh, change the access modifier for the constructor and if you remember back to the presentation on functions, remember when we talked about the difference between formal parameters and actual parameters, we can actually apply that concept here with default constructors, where although we're not supposed to be passing in values to the default constructor, because that would be an example of a non-default constructor, what we can do is we can actually set up a formal parameter within the parentheses of the default constructor, which is assigned a default value. Therefore, we don't actually have to pass any values to the default constructor. We can call it as we normally would, not passing anything, but the default value, which is assigned within the parentheses of the default constructor, can then be assigned to the data member of the class. So effectively, it would allow us to do the same thing where we could assign a particular value, 
is usually going to be zero unless it's going to be something else by default, uh, either within the contents of the constructor itself, as we saw on the previous slides, or within the parentheses of the default constructor here. The only difference is that the default value is specified within the parentheses rather than within the contents itself. So perhaps this has an advantage if you want to reuse the particular default value, uh, saves you having to manually specify it for multiple data members. Perhaps if you wanted to assign the value of zero to more than one data member, you could assign that uh, to a variable here, in this case it's v, and then assign v to every other data member that you want it assigned to. Uh, perhaps that would be a slight efficiency, but uh, regardless, um, that would perform the same functionality. Uh, but one thing to watch for though, is that you can't declare both a default constructor, which doesn't have a parameter list, uh, i.e. no default values being assigned within the parameter list, and a default constructor, which does have default values being assigned within the parameter list. Effectively, you can only have one default constructor, whatever the uh, format is that you choose to use. But what we're going to see in the following slides is that you can have a default constructor and multiple non-default constructors, which of course allow us to pass in any number of parameters. And in this slide here, we see two examples of non-default constructors. We see here that the class is still called my class, and in the private interface, we've got two integer data members being defined, int a and b. And then in the public interface, uh, notice that we have two functions. They're both of the same name, okay? And they both have the same name as the class. So therefore they are constructors. And because they take parameters, they are therefore non-default constructors as opposed to the default constructor, which doesn't take any parameters, unless they are a formal parameter, which has a default value assigned to it, which is the exception as we saw in the previous slide. So here, because the two functions have the same name, we actually have an example of overloading here. Remember that function overloading allows you to declare two functions of the same name, but as long as that they differ sufficiently in terms of the types of parameters that they accept or the different number of parameters that they accept, then there is a sufficient way to distinguish between which function that is going to be called because of course the compiler will look to match the number of values that are being passed to this function when it's called, presumably outside of the class in this case. When we create an object of this class, if we choose to pass two values then and the integer values, then those are going to be passed into the constructor that's set up to receive two integer values, which uh, here is the second one. But then, of course, if we declare an object and pass one value, one integer value, uh, to the constructor, then, of course, that invokes the constructor with one parameter. All right, so it's a simple way of matching the parameter list in order to distinguish which one is being called. But then of course the advantage is that we can keep uh, the same name because of course if we use a different function name, then effectively that's not going to be the constructor because remember that the constructor has to have the same name as the class. So we couldn't say have my class one and my class two. And likewise, we couldn't say my class int or my class two integers or something like that, because it's got to have the same name exactly as the name of the class. So setting up multiple non-default constructors will allow you to pass in as many data members uh, as you need to, to define the particular objects. Um, and you'll notice here in the first uh, my class constructor, which only takes one parameter, notice that the parameter is assigned to the data member A, and then the B, a data member, is then set to zero, initialized to zero. So if we don't know a particular piece of data, when we create the object, we can initialize some of the ones we don't know, but then pass in the values for the data members that we do know. And of course, then you can have more non-default constructors to allow you to pass in different combinations of data to then assign to the data members. Okay, as we see in the second my class constructor, the non-default constructor here, uh, which passes in two 
data members, which N and M are then respectively assigned to A and B. Okay, so here we do have the value for B, which is to be assigned the value passed in for M. So here we see two examples of non-default constructors, uh, which are syntactically legal. That's uh, perfectly fine to run them as they are. But bear in mind that we do also need to define a default constructor if we are going to define non-default constructors. Okay, it's possible that you can define a default constructor without non-default constructors, but this doesn't work the other way around. The compiler is going to expect a definition for the default constructor if you have non-default constructors. And it's the case that if we define the non-default constructors without the default constructor, then the compiler doesn't automatically create the default constructor, which is actually a problem because that doesn't allow us to then compile and run our code. So in the example in the last blue box here, we wouldn't actually be able to create a static object of this class because we haven't defined the my class default constructor within my class. And of course, when it comes to invoking the non-default constructor, we can do this by creating a dynamic object of the class, which we've been through many times. And of course, at the end of the instruction here in the first blue box, uh, rather than leaving the parameter list empty, we of course can write in as many values as we wish to pass to a corresponding non-default constructor. So here in this case, uh, we're only passing one value. So that would correspond with a non-default constructor that accepts one integer value. Okay, and then of course for the stack, uh, we don't have an explicit call to the constructor, uh, but we do append the parentheses to the uh, creation of the object itself. So here we state the my class class, the class name, and then we create a object name. And at the end of that, we can append the parentheses passing a value inside that. And then that gets sent through to the non-default constructor. We're not allowed to do that for a default constructor, as we saw right at the start of the presentation. So there is a, a syntax difference there. If you want to call the default constructor, you don't include any parentheses at all and no parameters, because of course the uh, default constructor doesn't take any parameters anyway. So it's just uh, my class, my object, semicolon for calling the default constructor. Okay, but for the non-default constructor, you can then have the parentheses and of course, uh, pass the values inside the parentheses. And um, just before we move on, there's one last uh, point to make, and that if you declare an array of objects, uh, that does require a default constructor because that's automatically invoked by the compiler. So in this case, um, assuming we haven't added the default constructor to the code, uh, the class definition for my class on the previous slide, um, we wouldn't be able to then declare an array of my class objects as we are attempting to do so in the last blue box at the bottom of this slide. And uh, as we've been seeing over the previous slides, it's conventional to initialize data members within the constructor. Uh, in previous versions of C++, uh, I think pre C++ 2011 uh, version, it was actually illegal to initialize data members of any interface of a class definition, whether it's public, private, or protected. But uh, if you remember, we said that uh, in recent versions, post uh, C++ 2011, uh, it is actually possible now to initialize data members within a interface of a class. However, the constructor is still conventional and still the place to go to actually initialize uh, data members. But uh, it is still conventional and best practice to assign values for our data members within our constructors. And of course, uh, a good reason for this is that uh, we may want to assign different values for different objects. So it wouldn't make sense to assign the same value for every 
objects because of course they might have different names they may have different ids so it wouldn't make sense to have every object with the same id of one okay so this is why we want to set up non-default constructors so that we can pass in a value to then set it as we increment ids or type in different names for different objects and we can also make use of the member initializer, which is the colon, to allow us to assign our values that we're passing in to our data members before we even get to the braces. Okay, this is a shorthand way of doing that assignment without having to write the assignment in the braces themselves. Okay, so if you have a look at the example here, you'll notice that uh, in the definition of the my class constructor, it's a non-default constructor because we're passing in uh, a integer value to the value data member. And you'll notice there afterwards, we write colon and then value, which is the data member of the class, followed by a pair of brackets, and then within that is the parameter, the value, which has just been declared in the same line before we get to this part. So we can then immediately assign the value parameter to value data member, and then open the braces and immediately close the braces. Okay, because if that's the only purpose uh, of the non-default constructor, then we don't actually need to put anything else within the braces. Okay, so this is just a shorthand way of doing the same task uh, as an alternative to writing that assignment within the braces. And you're gonna see this is also a handy feature for passing values to a parent constructor. We're gonna have a look at this in a few slides time when we talk about inheritance and constructors. So you'll see it being used then, but of course it can be used in a non-inheritance way as we see here. Yes, and speaking of inheritance, we're going to have a look at a few examples here of how constructors apply in a inheritance hierarchy. And so if we have a look at the example here, we've gone back to the car and model example where model is the parent of which car is the child and inherits from model as you'll see in the second blue box here, the middle blue box, where we declare class car and then colon public model. So remember that is stating that we want to publicly inherit from the model class. In the main function here, we're creating a dynamic object of the car class, which of course has a explicit call to the car constructor, the default constructor. Notice there's no parameters being passed and we've got a default constructor being defined within the car class, which just prints out car constructor invoked. But if you have a look at the print screen to the left of that, you'll notice that when we create a object of the child class that automatically invokes the default constructor of the parent class. So you'll notice that we actually print out model constructor invoked first, which is what's going to be printed from the model constructor, as you'll see in the top blue box. And then immediately following that is the call to the car constructor, the child constructor. So just remember this when you're creating your objects of uh, child classes that they will automatically invoke uh, the constructor of the parent class as well. But do remember that the same rule applies to the parent as it does to the child. Remember that we said that if we're going to specify a non-default constructor for a class, we also need to specify the default constructor as well. And you'll see here that this rule also applies in the inheritance hierarchy too. Because notice here that we've got a non-default constructor for the parent class, which is model. And we've also got a non-default constructor for the child class, car. But we haven't got default constructors for either of those two classes. So when we come to create a dynamic object of the car class again, because we haven't got default constructors and we've specified a non-default, the compiler is not going to automatically create a default constructor. And therefore, uh, we won't actually be able to compile this code. 
Okay, so just remember that the same rules that apply to a single class when it's not inheriting also apply in the inheritance hierarchy as well. But the benefits of an inheritance hierarchy actually mean that we don't have to create a default constructor in both the parent and the child. We can actually just create a default constructor in the parent class. As we see here, we've specified uh, in the top blue box that we've got the model default constructor, which takes no parameters. And we've also got a non-default constructor uh, below it, which takes one parameter, the model ID. And in the car class, in the second blue box, we don't have a default constructor. We've just got the non-default constructor. So when we come to create our dynamic object now, remember that we call the parent's default constructor first when we create an object of the child. This will then allow the code to run. Okay, so we will actually be able to compile this now, but note that uh, there's a particular problem in this setup because uh, in the car class, we're passing in the value of free, but as this code stands, we've got a particular uh, logical problem because when we create the object of the car class, uh, we're invoking the non-default constructor, we actually pass the uh, value of free to the car constructor, which takes in an integer, but notice that we're not assigning it anywhere. And uh, this is going to be a problem because that value is going to be lost. Even though the ID exists in the model class, the parent, we haven't yet assigned it to that ID. Okay, because we call the default constructor of model, not the non-default constructor of model, which does actually attempt to sign it. Please note that the, the non-default constructor will be invoked in the child, hence where we're trying to pass free to, but when it comes to the parent, it automatically invokes the non-default constructor. But the good news is that we can fix this by using the member initializer, which we looked at a few slides ago. And if you have a look at the second blue box here, the car class, notice that we've modified the car's non-default constructor to actually call the model's non-default constructor. And actually, we're doing this before we get to the braces. We're using the colon again. So like we did with the previous examples, where we actually just uh, assign the values of the parameters to the data members of that class, what we've got here is we've got a call to the parent's constructor, and specifically the non-default constructor. And we're going to pass that car ID, the uh, parameter, in the car non-default constructor, we're going to pass that to the model's non-default constructor. Okay, so this is actually an explicit call to the model's non-default constructor, which is all done before we even get to the braces, because you notice there we've got an empty pair of braces. So this effectively allows us to pass up the data from the child to the parent, okay? Because then in the parent class, in the parent's non-default constructor, which is uh, model, notice there that the parameter model ID is then assigned to the data member ID, which as we've got now public access to that, because we inherit publicly, we can then go on to refer to the car's ID for that object because we've assigned it. Okay, the only difference is that it's located in the parent rather than in the child. And of course, remember the, the benefits of inheritance, this then saves us having to declare duplicate ID data members in all of the children classes. We can locate it centrally in the parent and then just refer to it for uh, objects of that class family. We've mentioned before that the compiler will automatically generate a default constructor if one isn't coded or defined in the class. And uh, it will also generate a copy constructor, a copy assignment operator, and a destructor, again, if these are not defined. But uh, what we can do is actually specify the prototype for the default constructor, as we see here in the blue box at the bottom of the screen, uh, which specifies the interface for the game object default constructor but uh, it as this is the interface it doesn't actually define it and um, 
uh, if you remember back to the previous presentations, we said that uh, if that definition is missing, uh, this creates a problem for the compiler. So it's the case that uh, if you're going to specify a prototype, you have to then define it. Or if you don't want to do this, then don't indicate any interface for the constructor at all. Just let the compiler uh, automatically generate it it's uh, either all or nothing. You have to specify the entire constructor with the prototype and the definition or just let the compiler generate it automatically. But what we can do is, uh, as we see here, is that we can actually declare the prototype for the default constructor and then we can assign the default keyword. Okay, and that is like a halfway in between those two options. That then tells the compiler to generate the definition automatically. This will get around the syntax problem and allow the code to compile if you want to specify the prototype for the default constructor. And uh, we've got a little note here to say that this wasn't implemented in earlier versions of Visual Studio in the 2012 version, but uh, this does run in the 2019 version of Visual Studio, the current version at time of recording. Uh, let's move on now and have a look at the keyword this, uh, which we mentioned right at the start in the introduction to the presentation. And uh, if you've not used the keyword this before, this is a very handy mechanism because it's a pointer to the current object that's using the code specified in the class. All right, so as we know, our class is going to be a template in which you can instantiate many objects from. So what we have to do is you have to try and write our class so that it can be reused by lots of different objects. We don't want to specify hard-coded references to certain objects or indeed values because of course these are going to change across the different objects. Therefore, we don't want to include hard-coded references to certain objects because of course every time this function is called on a different object, it's always going to refer to the same object. All right, so this is a handy way to point towards the current object in a given application that's currently referring to this function or this uh, piece of code. So it acts a little bit like a placeholder and then is substituted with the memory address, points towards the memory address of the current object that's accessing this code. In C++, we can only refer to it within uh, member functions because it's actually passed as an implicit parameter. Okay, it's not stated. Uh, it's passed implicitly to the member functions. It's kind of bundled in with the function call. Uh, we're going to uh, come on to have a look at that uh, later in the module. Here in the my class constructor, we're referring to the data member value. So that's referring to the data member of a object. And uh, what we can do is we can then assign it the value parameter. So this allows us to distinguish between the data members and the parameters. Because note here in this case, they actually have the same name. And uh, whilst the compiler is usually intelligent enough to work out what's being assigned to what, the, this keyword does add clarity there. It does avoid the ambiguity of, of which one <laughs> is being referred to. So we can refer to the data member value through pointing to it with the pointer this, referring to the object that's uh, currently using this code or that's been created, of course, as it's the constructor. And then that then distinguishes that from the value which is the integer parameter. Okay, so this is a, a handy way of referring to an object without actually having to state the name of the object. So effectively, this allows us to reuse the code that we've specified in the member functions for all of the objects of this given class. And another thing to note is that when we come to pass objects to functions, we actually pass the objects by reference. So remember in a previous presentation, we contrasted the different methods of passing. We looked at 
passing by value, passing by reference, passing by constant reference, and passing by pointer, it's not really feasible to pass the entire object by value uh, because A, we've got to then pass it back when if we make a change to the state of the object, and B, we've got lots of different things contained within the object itself. We haven't got a single value of a primitive type. So it's not really feasible to pass an object by value. So therefore, it's much easier to pass an object by passing its memory address. And of course, we do that through references, if you remember. And so we set up a reference type using the ampersand, which is the reference operator, referring to the class type that uh, the object is made of. Okay, we're gonna see that on the next slide. And we define this uh, reference variable because remember it acts like an alias. It is technically a variable that's defined, but it then holds, it then takes on the memory address of a different variable that's passed to it, in this case, an object of that same type. So of course we have to define this within the uh, formal parameters of the function that's receiving the object reference. And uh, just note that uh, this uh, reference being passed to it has to be defined in some capacity. We can't actually define it to be zero or null. And then this will allow us to refer to the object that we're about to pass in to this function in order to update one of its uh, data members or indeed call one of the functions on it. So let's have a look at an example in this slide here, where if you cast your eye to the class NPC, uh, notice here in the function perform, we've declared a formal parameter, which is command reference, notice the ampersand there, and then given it the alias of C and then through that reference to an object of the command class, which is defined up above, we can then call the print function through that alias. It's basically substituting for the object of that class, which is actually gonna be defined within the main function, as we see below. So let's go there and have a look in the first line of the main function, where we see we actually create a static object on the stack uh, of the command class. We pass 20 to the non-default constructor of command, which is assigned the ID and uh, then in the line below we then create a static object of NPC and then further down after we've created the object of NPC and then called the print function for the command object and then in the fourth line we call the perform function of NPC which takes a reference to a command object so we can pass it CMD and then the reference for that is then passed through to the receiving reference alias. Okay, so that variable defined in the perform function of MPC takes the memory address of the actual command object and then through that can then call the print function, which then performs the same task as the third line in the uh, main function here. So we call the print function directly through the command object, which is defined in main. And then we do the same thing, but just in a different function in MPC through the reference. And notice in the left-hand side, uh, in the output, we see 20 and 20. So we see the same ID being printed out to tell us that we've called the same function. Okay, so just remember that if you're gonna be passing your objects to different functions, uh, this is done through references. So just remember to define a reference variable rather than a standard primitive type variable, which you would for passing by value. Let's talk about copy constructors now. And a copy constructor is what it says on the tin. It's a constructor which copies the contents of one object into another object. The object will be unique, but it will share the same values as the one that's being copied from. 
technically are unique objects because they have different memory addresses, but it allows you to duplicate the data from one object into another. So this saves you having to define all of this data multiple times uh, by invoking the non-default constructors. It's far simpler just to specify the object that you want to duplicate. Okay, so we're going to have a look at uh, defining our own user-defined copy constructors. Of course, the compiler automatically invokes one, even if it uh, doesn't do much on the surface. We have the chance to uh, define our own copy constructor so that we can manually copy the contents of the different objects that we want to. And of course, this isn't going to be a problem for standard uh, primitive type data, which is essentially copied by value. But of course, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when we talk about pointers and memory addresses. OK, so we're going to explore the difference between shallow copies and deep copies uh, in the next few slides. But uh, let's start with a basic example, which we see here in the blue box. We see an example of a copy constructor. And as it's a constructor, it will have the same name as the class. So that doesn't change. It's a, it's a function, as we see. We've got the parentheses. And within the parentheses, we see a single parameter, which notice we've got the keyword const, referring to constant. And also notice that we're expecting an object, a variable of class type, as we see the uh, reference to the class name again. And notice it also has a reference as well, the reference operator, the ampersand. So we're expecting a constant reference to a object of this class type. So this will be passing by constant reference, which is uh, one of the ways of passing, as we've said before. So we're passing by constant reference here to prevent us from accidentally changing any of the values being stored at the object. Uh, of course, we don't want to do that. We want to create a copy of it. So we want to try and keep that safe. We want to try and prevent changes. So that's why we're uh, passing by constant reference. And uh, we don't currently have any implementation in this copy constructor. We're going to come to that. But just before we do, let's look at a number of different scenarios in which the copy constructor is invoked. Okay, so it's invoked when we initialize one object from another of the same type. It's also initialized when we attempt to pass an object as an argument to the formal parameter. It's also invoked when we want to copy an object and return it from a function. And you'll also find it invoked when we attempt to initialize the elements in a sequential container data structure. And it's also invoked when we attempt to initialize the elements in an array when the initializer list is used. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the next slide where we see some of these cases being demonstrated. And so notice here that we've kept the same example of the class called my class, and we've got a default constructor in the public interface, and we've also got our copy constructor, as you'll see there, the it's not a constant reference this time, but it is still a reference to an object of the my class type. And uh, we haven't yet uh, coded it to create a copy just yet. We're going to do that soon. But we have just got an output here so that we know when the copy constructor is going to be invoked. Uh, so now let's uh, cast our eye down to the main function and uh, work through that line by line to determine whether the copy constructor is going to be invoked or not. And in the first line, we create two static objects of my class. So they're called obj1 and obj2. And then in the second line, we create a static object called obj3 of my class. But notice in the parentheses, we actually pass obj1 which is the object of my class. And uh, as we're passing an object of the same type, obj1, this invokes the copy constructor. So we'll see that printed to the screen. But if we have a look at the third line now, where we assign obj1 to obj3, notice there that that doesn't invoke the copy constructor. That just simply initializes obj3. However, when we have a class type with uh, the declaration of obj4, we're, we're creating a static object on the stack, and then we assign it obj2, that does invoke the copy constructor. Okay, so that's the, the difference between line 3 and 4 there. Okay, so if you want to call the copy constructor, you have to state the class type there, my class. All right, that's the difference between those two lines.
And uh, if we have a look at the final two lines here, uh, notice that we pass obj1 to uh, the function do something on object two. Because the function do something accepts an object of my class type, even though it's not a reference to that, uh, it does actually invoke the copy constructor. That's uh, scenario two from the previous slide. Okay, and then also uh, in the final line of the main function, because we return an object, if you have a look in the return an object function in my class now, notice that we uh, declare an object of my class and then return it. Because that's being returned, that also invokes the copy constructor. And uh, that illustrates uh, scenario three from the previous slide where we copy an object to return it from a function. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. This uh, slide here just illustrates some of the scenarios in which the copy constructor will be invoked and uh, some of the scenarios where it won't be invoked. So now that we've explored the differences between when the copy constructor will be invoked and when it won't be, let's go on now and have a look at how we'd actually implement the copy constructor to either create shallow copies or deep copies of objects. And by creating shallow copies of objects, what we mean is that in addition to duplicating all of the data members that are of primitive type, such as integers, strings, chars, booleans, etc., and all the values that have been assigned to those data members, and of course the member functions, we also copy the dynamically allocated memory, and specifically the pointer data members. So if we have pointers set up to point towards another memory location, in our duplicate, in our copy of that object, the pointer in that object will also point towards the same memory location. So you'll have two objects that point towards the same location, or more than two. So basically saying that all of the copies of the object that are copied from the first one will point towards the same data as the first one. Whereas in the deep copy, this doesn't happen. All of the pointers that are duplicated don't automatically point towards the same location. They're actually just initialized uh, so that they can then be assigned to a different location, another location if needs be. Okay, so that's the main difference between the shallow copy and the deep copy. And we're going to explore how that works over the next few slides. And the deep copy would also implement the destructor to free up the dynamic memory, which was uh, assigned in the original, uh, but then hence is uh, no longer going to be assigned with the deep copies, and also overload the assignment operator in addition to that. So uh, we're going to have a look at the destructor in a later presentation when we have a look at memory management. So we'll, we'll actually cover the destructor then. Okay, but for now, let's focus upon creating the user-defined copy constructor, where we can define it to create shallow copies and deep copies. So as we've said before, um, when we define our own copy constructor, we can set it up with a parameter, which is a constant parameter. It's a constant reference, because notice we've got the reference operator as well, uh, to an object of the class name. So this ensures that we don't accidentally modify the values of the copy, regardless of whether we are uh, creating a shallow copy or a deep copy, we don't want to change the values. Uh, the only difference with the deep copy is that we don't want to copy the memory that's being pointed to. So that's where the destructor is invoked. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look at an example of creating a shallow copy, and then we're gonna go on to have a look at how we could create a deep copy. So starting with the shallow copy, let's have a look at the code here. And uh, notice here that we've got a new class called shallow class, which in the public interface has a data member, which happens to be a pointer, because notice we've got the asterisk. And this pointer is of type data, which if you have a look on the right hand side, the light green colored box, notice there we see the class for data. Okay, so this pointer is going to point to a variable, a piece of memory that holds values of type data, which could be an object of that class. So underneath that, we've got a shallow class constructor, 
it looks to be the default constructor because it doesn't take any parameters. And notice within that, it just uh, does exactly what we thought it would do. It creates a dynamic object of data and puts it on the heap and then gets the value pointer to point to that object on the heap. Okay, we also invoke the non-default constructor of data, uh, which then assigns data, the actual value of zero to uh, the data attributes within the class data. And uh, notice here, we don't have the default constructor specified in data. Uh, perhaps that was just omitted for the purpose of this example, but uh, it would always be a good idea to specify the default constructor in that class, as we've got a non-default constructor as well, which takes a parameter. But assuming that was just admitted to save space, uh, let's uh, keep going here. And uh, back to the shallow class, notice underneath the default constructor, we've got a copy constructor. And we can tell that, of course, because it takes a constant reference to an object of type shallow class, the, the class we're operating within. And notice within that copy constructor, we've got the implementation. This is where we do the copying. Okay, so this is where we point towards the value data member of this class. We're using the this keyword, which we said before is a pointer to the current object that's being used. So this will be substituted at the given point when an object is referring to this code. And uh, this will point towards the data member value and then assign it the value data member of the constant reference that's being passed in. So this allows us then to create copies for future. So when the copy constructor is invoked for a new object that is being copied to, that object calls the copy constructor, then copying the value into its own data member. So let's now look at the main function, where in the first line, we create a static object of shallow class. And uh, we've got a note here to say this will fail if no default constructor exists. And um, I don't know if that refers to the missing default constructor in data or not, but we do have a, a default constructor in the shallow class. So the shallow class should operate, um, but we may be best to specify one in data as well, just to ensure this works. But then notice in the line below that is where we invoke the uh, copy constructor, copying the object one into object two statically. So that will replicate the value that's being pointed to, uh, which is zero right from the first instance. And uh, that object two will be set up to also point towards that same value, uh, the same uh, object of type data, uh, the class, which happens to have the value of zero for its own data member data. And then also in the third line, we also invoke the copy constructor because remember, this is another scenario in which the copy constructor is invoked. And this format will set up a third object, which then copies the values from object two, which as that's a copy of object one, that should be the same as well. And then if we have a look at the fourth line here, this is where we actually update the data member to a different value. Whenever we initialized it with zero, uh, to start with, but then notice here how we're assigning 25 to that data member. And even though we assign this just for the first object, because the duplicates, the copies of this object also have that same memory address, it's going to point towards that updated value as well. So hence in the following lines, when we output the value for that data member to screen, we actually see 25 output for all of them. Okay, so this exemplifies uh, what a shallow copy is, where if you duplicate the pointers and the, the memory addresses that uh, the pointer of the first object points to, you will also point towards that same data in all of the copies. But now on the flip side, let's have a look at an example of creating a deep copy of an object. So here we've kept most of the same structure, except we've changed the name of the class. It's now called deep class, and hence the constructors are also updated to refer to the deep class class name. 
we still got the constant reference being passed to the copy constructor and uh, the default constructor still initializes the uh, pointer to get it to point towards a object created on the heap of type data. Uh, in, and then we pass zero to the data member in data and again, I notice in the class data, we haven't got the default constructor again. We've just got the non-default. Uh, probably best to add that in if you're going to code this example, just, just to make sure that it works. But that's just a small thing because that's not the, the point of this example, because we want to focus upon creating deep copies of our objects, uh, which we have now set up the copy constructor in the deep class class to do. So notice now the implementation has changed. So if we cast our eye back to the previous slide where we created the shallow copy, that was where we assigned the data member, the actual pointer to the uh, value pointer of a copy. So therefore it's gonna point towards the same address all the time. But notice in the deep copy example, we're actually creating a whole new object on the heap because notice there we call the data non-default constructor in which we actually pass something different to it. So notice here that we're referring to the constant reference C. So it's an object of type deep class. So it's an object of the same class basically. And we're referring to the value pointer and they were pointing to data. So what's that value going to be? So it's essentially an integer because data is an integer type. If you remember, we actually called the default constructor before we call the copy constructor. And in the default constructor, we actually assign zero to that data member. So you should find that when we refer to data, that should be zero. So effectively, you can replace c.value point towards data with zero. So we're, not assign so we're not assigning the same pointer as we did previously. We're actually setting up a whole new object to point to and just initializing it with zero. And if we come down to the main function now, you'll see that when we do all of the same copying as what we did previously in the first three lines, where we declare three static objects and invoke the copy constructor on the second two, we copy the contents of the first into the second and then the second into the third. And then in the fourth line, we attempt to do what we did previously, where we update the value of data, the data member in the class data to 25 on the first object. And then if we attempt to print out all of those values to screen, we get 25 for the first object. But because we're not pointing to the same data this time, we're not pointing to that same memory address, the memory address of the data member in class data because we've created separate objects, or more specifically, every time we call the copy constructor, we create a new object of class data. That's going to be at a different memory address, and it's just initialized with zero. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, the difference between shallow copies and deep copies. If you want to create unique copies, as we do here, then applying the deep copy methodology would be the right way to go. However, if you want literal copies, uh, like we saw in the previous slide, where even if you make a change to the first one, it then updates in all the, the copies, then it would be better to use the shallow copy approach. And just before we move on from the copy constructors, note here that we can actually explicitly define that we want to prevent uh, our objects from being copied by using the keyword delete. We can actually assign the keyword delete to the copy constructor, which is a user defined one, to prevent the uh, objects from being copied uh, implicitly. Because of course, remember, the compiler will automatically create a copy constructor if we don't define one. So we can actually prevent this by explicitly defining that we want to delete the memory where the user defined copy constructor is located. So should you find yourself wanting to do this, wanting to prevent implicit copies of objects, then this is actually a modern way of doing it. This is post C++ 2011, where you can apply the delete specifier to constructors. 
the previous way of doing it before C++11 would have been to make the copy constructors private so that they can't be invoked. Okay, so using the delete keyword is just a modern way of uh, restricting implicit function calls. And of course, this does apply to other functions as well, non-constructor functions. And uh, here in this example, because we've specified the copy constructor to be deleted, we then can't run the code that's in the main function because we are, of course, attempting to create a copy. Okay, so it actually won't compile. All right, it just will give a syntax error there. So here we'd actually have to remove the code which attempts to make a copy. Uh, let's talk about converting constructors now, or you may also see them referred to as conversion constructors. And uh, when you see converting or conversion, think about casting, where you actually convert data types. And uh, see here in the main function of this example that we're attempting to assign the integer value of 25 to a static object of the conversion class. And uh, whilst the object ultimately does have a data member, which is an integer, as you'll see there in the private interface of the class conversion called A, the actual object structure, we're not technically able to assign 25 to an object because it's a complex type. It's not of type integer. It's of type conversion. So this conversion constructor can actually enable the conversion of that integer type in to, uh, or, well, in this case, it's actually going to assign it to the integer data type within the conversion class, all right? But uh, of course, if we had more um, data types, maybe we had multiple integers in there or multiple string types and Booleans and chars. Ultimately, this is a, a not a clean way of doing it, okay? It works where we've got uh, one value, but as we know, objects are complex type. They can store multiple data members and ultimately have have lots of different functions as well. So this conversion constructor can help aid that process of converting a piece of data, in this case an integer, converting it and storing it somewhere within the object, which we see here in the public interface, where we've defined our own conversion constructor or converting constructor, where you'll see there it actually takes in the value and then just assigns it to A in the uh, initializer list using the colon there. So, and then it just prints it out to screen as well. So we know it's there. And this conversion uh, back to the main where we're attempting to assign 25 to an object um, and our converting constructor reconciles that by putting it within a integer data member. Because we haven't stated explicitly the data type to cast, remember that explicit casting is where we would encase the data type within a pair of brackets, curly brackets, parentheses, if you like, next to the type of data we want to convert. Because we haven't got that, this is regarded to be implicit conversion, where in this case, we're not stating the type and we are leaving it to the conversion constructor as we've specified in the public interface to actually resolve this uh, conversion. But as we said, this isn't the cleanest way of uh, resolving the two different uh, data types. Ultimately, the object of type conversion is very different to the standard primitive type of integer. So this can get confusing. Okay, And for that reason, actually, it might be better to just not allow <laughs> the conversions in the first place. And you can do that by actually including the keyword explicit uh, before the definition of the conversion constructor, as we see uh, in this slide. And this will actually uh, prevent the code from compiling, disallowing that uh, casting of data type here from integer to object type. All right, so that's a way we can actually turn this behavior off uh, by declaring our own user-defined uh, conversion constructor and uh, then making it explicit. And uh, lastly, we're going to finish this presentation by looking at static members of classes. And of course, we can apply the keyword static to both data members or member functions of a class.
And the key thing about static is that we don't have to create an object of the class in order to access static members, whether that's data members or member functions. Okay, we can actually refer to them directly through the class name. We can, of course, access them and refer to them through objects, but of course, this doesn't work the other way around because for dynamic members, we have to create an object of the class in order to access them. Okay, so here we see an example where we've actually created a static data member, it's an integer, and it belongs to the class. It's declared in the public interface of the class, so it will be accessible via all the objects created of this class. And uh, it's, it's a bit like a global variable, but just limited to the scope of the class. So it's accessible by all the objects of the class, and it's also accessible through the class name itself. And this is a chance where we can actually refer to the same value by different objects. So even if we update it in one object, we can then refer to that updated value through another object, okay? It will be applicable and uh, global to all objects of the class as well as through the class name itself. And so here in this case, in our constructor for this class player, we're actually incrementing instances. So we would need to initialize instances uh, somewhere. And uh, it wouldn't make sense to initialize it in the constructor like we do for our uh, dynamic data members of an object, because in that case, every time we call the constructor, it's going to be reset to zero. So it would actually be better to uh, initialize it either to zero or another value somewhere else. And so for that reason, because the class and the constructor is going to be utilized multiple times for creating objects of the class, it would be better to initialize static members, in this case, just one of them, static member, outside of the class definition to avoid those multiple initializations. And so we can actually place it within the CPP uh, or the actual main file where that's located. As we do here, we actually place it just above the main function. And you'll notice here that the uh, format for this is uh, referring to the data type first, so int, and then player, which is the class in which uh, instances is located. Then you notice the two colons. So hopefully you remember that's the scope resolution operator, which we use to refer to functions through the class name, where they're located, of course, within the class. And uh, here in this case, we're not referring to a function, but we are referring to the static member instances through which we then initialize to zero. Okay, so you can place this in your main file, the program file, uh, or place it within the CPP of the class uh, where you might define other functions, but uh, you don't want to place it in the header file because, of course, that's going to be referenced multiple times. Yes, and uh, as we said earlier, the static members can be accessed through a object of the class or through the class name directly as we see an example for this here in the blue box where we have created a dynamic object of player type in the first line and uh, then in the third line we refer to the instances static member through the dereference operator the arrow but in the second line, uh, notice the capital P player, that's referring to the class. And then after that, we've got the scope resolution operator, uh, the two colons. And we also refer to instances through the class name. So we've got lots of different options there for referring to static data members. And uh, they will hold the same value regardless of uh, which object you're referring to it through. Okay, because if you have multiple objects, you should refer to the same instances value uh, because it will be global to all objects. And let's talk a little bit about static member functions now. Now that we've covered static data members, let's talk about functions and how we declare them to be static. And uh, the one thing to note about static member functions is that if they're defined in the context of a class, they only have access to static data members declared in that class. They don't actually have access to the dynamic data members of the class, because remember, we need to create an object in order to access the dynamic data members. 
And uh, this also means that we can't then apply the keyword this to static member functions. It's not actually passed in as a parameter. And even if it was, it wouldn't be in the context of an object. So it wouldn't work in the context of calling this function through the class name because there's no object address to pass in or refer to through the keyword this. Okay, so when it comes to actually declaring a static member function, we have to prefix the uh, declaration of the member function with the keyword static. So before the return type, it's going to be static and then return type and then the name of the function and with optional parameters. Okay, so that bit's still the same as a dynamic member function. It's just the addition of the keyword static uh, at the front of it. And uh, the final point to mention is that if they're declared outside the scope of a class, and uh, think back to the early weeks of this module where we actually declared the functions within the main file outside of the main function, we didn't have to use the keyword static in front of those. We just wrote the return type and then the function name and then any optional parameters. Okay, so that is an example of where we don't have to write the keyword static if it's declared outside of a class. Uh, but here in this example, we do see both our static data member, uh, which we saw earlier, and we've also declared a static member function of the class player. Okay, in here, in this case, we've just prefixed that member function with the keyword static so that it can be referred to directly through the class name in addition to a player object as well. Okay, but of course, we don't have access to the keyword this or even the uh, dynamic data members of the class. In this case, there aren't any, but uh, if we're using it in combination with dynamic data members, then uh, we wouldn't have access to those. So uh, we've got all of the elements that we've seen before, uh, but uh, in the main function here, we've got our dynamic uh, instance of player through which we can refer to the print static values member function uh, through the dereference operator, the arrow. And then of course, in the line below, we can refer to it directly through the class player, as you'll notice there, capital P for player, and then the scope resolution operator, and then refer to their function name. Okay, so I hope that makes sense in regard to static uh, member functions and data members. And uh, this actually brings us to the end of the presentation. So let's transition here and have a look at some of the exercises for this week. Right, so let's get started with some of the exercises for this week. And before we jump into exercise one, we've actually got to set up a game object class, which we'll see here above the exercise one heading. And we're instructed to define a new class named game object, which should have a single public data member named ID, which is of type int. So let's go ahead and set that up first of all. And if we go to project, and then choose the add class option like we've done before. This is where we can type in the name of the class and then that is used to generate the H file, the header file, as well as the CPP file, the implementation file for us. So it saves us having to set them up individually. We can just write it once and then it generates both files for us. Okay, and we don't need to worry about the base class here. We're not going to be doing any inheritance as of yet. So let's go ahead and press OK to generate both the header file, which we see uh, the, the kind of the interface for the class, which is going to become the interface when we start adding details to it. And then we've got the implementation file, which is the CPP here. Okay, so I'm going to pin these so we don't lose them. And uh, let's add in our data member. This is going to go in the public interface. So I need to write public there. And let's write int ID. Okay. And um, as of yet, we're not instructed to write a constructor. I think that's uh, part of the exercise. It's part of the uh, lesson to make us uh, see why we need it. So uh, let's uh, let's stick with that. So uh, let's follow through with that. And, um, and let's, uh, within main, create a static identifier named obj1. And it's of type game object and then attempt to display the value of the ID data member within the console. Yes, it's public. So we should be able to do this. 
Uh, so let's go back to our main function and I need to include a reference now to game objects like we've done before because we're using another class and another file. I only need to include the reference to the header file because then I've got links to the CPP through that. So you'll see the uh, link there. Okay, uh, so let's go back to the main. And uh, just to save us having to write STD all the time, let's say using no space STD here. Okay, meaning that I can now write C out there. And let's repurpose this just for some uh, formatting here. Let's just say this is uh, week four um, constructors. You don't have to do this. This is just for uh, my formatting. And let's just say this is uh, exercise one. And uh, let's just have some new lines. Okay, so here we want to create a static object. So remember, we refer to the name of the type, which is game object. That's the class type. We want to create a variable of, a object of, and then we just write obj1. And then remember, we don't have the parentheses for a static object. Uh, we want to just write the uh, semicolon there. Okay. And uh, we want to attempt to print out the value of ID through that object. Okay, so if we try to do this, oh, we can't actually even run it. So <laughs> it won't even display the uh, uninitialized uh, local variable. So it's not letting us even display it. Uh, sometimes it might do that, perhaps in older versions of Visual Studio, but here it's caught the problem, which is uninitialized memory, okay? We haven't got a constructor, so we haven't uh, been able to define it, and within the constructor, we haven't actually defined the value for ID, okay? So it's flagging up there's a problem. So what we do need to do is, as we hinted earlier, we do need to add a constructor so that we can initialize the value to zero. Okay, so let's do that. So within our header file, let's add a function. It's gonna have the same name as the class. And remember the, the absence of parameters means it's the default constructor. Non-default is where we do accept parameters, which is gonna, we're gonna come to that. All right. and. Uh, I mean, as it's a fairly simple uh, constructor, I could actually expand upon it within here. But uh, just so we get used to writing out things in the CPP, let's actually define it here. So remember, it doesn't have a return type, which is what we'd have to write for uh, all of the other member functions of a class. Instead, we just start with the class scope and then scope resolution operator, the two colons, and then it's game object because it's got the same name as the class, the function. And then within here is where we could actually assign, initialize ID to zero. Okay. And if I want to, just so we get used to using this, I can make, I can be really specific and say that this ID has the value of zero. So the object that's referring to ID uh, should be initialized with zero. So that when we come back here, if we were to recompile this, hopefully that would solve the problem. Let's check here. Yes, and notice we do see now the value of zero printed to the screen. And uh, just out of interest, I wonder if, if we were to comment this out, and we've now that we've defined the constructor, Oh, there we go. That's what I was trying to show earlier and what I think we were trying to show, <laughs> this uninitialized value of ID. So if you see such a large negative number, that probably means that you haven't initialized an integer. Okay, so just be aware of that. So I'm going to uncomment this so we can use it now. And uh, hopefully this will answer the first question. So I hope you followed that and I uh, hope that makes sense. Let's now move on to the second exercise. We've now got to create a non-default constructor that takes the ID as an argument and then assigns it to the corresponding data member. So as we hinted earlier, let's go back to our header file and remember that the non-default constructor still has the same name so it's still game object okay uh, 
And remember that functions that have the same name uh, are overloaded functions. So this is an example of overloading, but we want to make a change to the parameter list so that we can differentiate between uh, the different uh, constructors, the different member functions, so we know what to call. Okay, and it's uh, saying here that it needs the definition, so we better go and add that in. But notice here that we can actually get away with just writing the type, uh, and uh, later we can expand upon that to have the identifier itself. So let's add in the definition for the non-default constructor, which does take an integer, so int id. And uh, we've got a number of different methods that we could use to assign this uh, parameter to our data member. We could use the initializer list. Remember, that's where we would say the parameter and then assign it as parameter within the brackets and then assign it to the data member before we even get to the braces. Or we could do the assignment within the braces itself. We could just say this uh, ID has the value of ID. Okay, and it's probably complaining because I've tried to do it twice. So let's uh, remove that now. And uh, I don't think this is necessary. Uh, let's just check. No, I think the compiler is intelligent enough to work out what's happening here. But just if you wanted to be explicit, as is the way in C++ and <laughs> state things uh, explicitly, just so you have complete control, um, this is a way of doing that where we can avoid the ambiguity and state exactly that we're referring to the data member here as it's a part of this class. It's being dereferenced through the this pointer, which is going to be substituted for the current object that's attempting to access this and uh, then assign it the parameter ID. As you see there, the highlighting refers to that. So when we click on this, uh, we don't see the parameter highlighted. But when we click on this one, we do see the parameter highlighted. So another way that you can tell <laughs> which one's which. All right, so let's go back and check everything's all right now. Yeah, we seem to resolve that problem now that we've uh, defined it, which is good. So I think now we're going back to main. And let's have a go at creating another static object of game objects. We've got to call it obj2 and invoke the non-default constructor and pass it 45. So this should be a similar format to what we've done before. We want to create another static object, obj2, and now we can have parameters. This is where we get to pass uh, a value to the non-default constructor and it has to match. So obviously we want to pass a single integer so that it corresponds and matches with the non-default constructor that accepts one integer. Okay, so that we place that in the parentheses here and that'll be passed through hopefully. And now when we come to print this out, uh, let's see, hopefully we should now see the value of 45 rather than zero. So let's uh, give this a go. And uh, there we go. We do see 45 there. That's good. That tells us that we've invoked the non-default constructor for this object and shows us that it's working correctly, which is excellent. Okay, and just the final exercise here, uh, exercise three, and then I'll let you guys have a go at it. So here we're instructed to make necessary changes to ensure that it's not possible to define an object use of game object using the default constructor. Okay, so, and after it, we've got to comment out the declaration of obj1 and the statement that displays the ID. Okay, so if you remember, there's a keyword that we can use to, in effect, render that default constructor, the, um, the explicit uh, declaration of it and definition of it, to be deleted. We can actually say equals delete there. We have no control over the automatic definition or declaration of the implicit uh, default constructor, but we can have power over this. Okay, so here is where we would say equals delete 
And then we've also got to comment out the um, definition as well. It can't have both. So just make sure that you comment out this uh, definition. And if we go back here now, that we've deleted the uh, memory that uh, the definition is supposed to be at. Uh, now, with that should pre prevent us from being able to create this object. And notice we've got the syntax there, the under syntax error there. So it's referring to a, a deleted function and hence doesn't let us run it. So now if we comment this out and try running only with a non-default constructor, which we see here, notice that we can now create objects, but we can't call the default constructor. Okay, so again, this is just the, the manual way, the, the way of really being explicit and having uh, you know, absolute control over what you can and can't do within C++. This is why we can be so specific in how we define things. Okay, so we actually um, bypass the automatic creation of the implicit default constructor and we actually delete our explicit one, okay, so that we render both useless, so that we can't use a default constructor. All right, so that's uh, how about the way that we go about doing that. Okay, so that's exercise three. Hope that made sense. Uh, probably best if you guys have a go at the remaining exercises here, uh, where you extend things further to use location class and uh, further add to the game object class. So hopefully that gets you started. Have a go at the rest of the exercises and see how you get on.